And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. A, pro a producer, creative, and a, and a self-proclaimed multi-hyphenate, the one and only Marlene Sharp. How are you doing tonight? Hello. Hi, Mildra. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm excited to be here. Thank you, for, thank you for coming into the temple. I suppose I should get the obvious out of the way. What the hell is a multi-hyphenate? <laughs> oh, is that a new term for you? The, we, there, Los Angeles is overrun with multi-hyphenates, so, um, so, but I, I can give you a little uh, explanation. Mm -hmm. So it's basically a person who has a lot of different job, jobs or job descriptions, especially in the entertainment business. So you, maybe you've heard of somebody who's an actor slash waiter or a uh, uh, Director, producer, writer, at, or uh, actor, costume character, <laughs> or <laughs> something like that. Yeah. So I, I guess the, the name is kind of misleading because people use slashes in between those terms as opposed to hyphens. So it's not 100% accurate, but the technical term is multi-hyphenate. And, and I... Am one of those. And to be fair, multi multi slasher just makes just makes you sound like you're trying to be Jason Voorhees or something. Maybe <laughs> um, if if it, it if it'll put put me to the head of the line for opportunities, okay. <laughs> but I don't know. Only if I'm one work in horror, maybe. But uh, yeah. Yeah. So a lot. When I did, I did my fair share of research, uh, research on on the matter, when, when do when doing this now. Based based obviously, I I have to take certain bits of research with with a with a grain of salt, especially with IMDb because the <laughs> you, the um user aggre aggregate creation rules apply. It when anybody can do it, it it's not it's not going to be the most reliable, much like a Wikipedia. True, um, true. But it had mentioned, but in that it had mentioned that you had earned a master of fine arts in musical theater. So I guess I guess I'll start with that since I like to start with the humble origins. Oh, um, yes, and that's a hundred percent true. So how did you how did you first get into just musical theater and just be and just being on stage? Period. I was born a show business kid, but in a family of non-show business people and I, I was born in New Orleans, Louisiana and I lived there until I was until I graduated from college and I guess uh, my, my family is theatrical in their own way but not necessarily on stage theatrical but my mom did take me to a lot of children's theater productions when I was a kid and I think that made an impression and I watched a ton of TV and I was always very nosy so I asked my mom about stuff like I, I wanted to go and visit the set of Sesame Street and I asked her will you tell me how to get to Sesame Street and uh, and she had, I know we had driven past the local PBS affiliate and somehow the connection was made, but my mom said, no, the, the puppets aren't there, they're in New York. And then she tried to explain public television and so forth to me. But what I gathered from those early conversations was that I did not live in the place where show business happened on a big scale. and. To this day, uh, that's true to a certain extent. There has been a lot more location filming in New Orleans and Louisiana, but it's not the place where projects originate. And um, so, so I, w I wanted to go to the big city. And uh, so I did what I could in my hometown. I, uh, let's see, I did a lot of theater and 
I, I went all the way through my undergrad school and then I, I graduated from Loyola, New Orleans, and then went on to the MFA musical theater program at San Diego State. Mm-hmm. And I'm guessing I'm guessing you had um, I'm guessing that in in do in stu- in studying that there were probably some there were probably some good ones and some and some bad and some bad ones when it comes to musicals that you st- that you um, studied. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. Because I've I've done I've been doing my own deep dives when it comes to the when it comes to the his, the history and ups and downs of musicals, um, in particular the rise oh. and fall of the mega musical. Okay, okay. And That's, are you a performer too? Um, I I've never done I've never done musicals. I've done a, I've done a few I've done a few stage plays. Um, mm-hmm. I did I did stunt work once oh. for an independent film. And that was one time to tell me that that I should not do it, because <laughs> um, one of the scenes we had to film was a bar fight, mm-hmm. and while well, they did use sugar glass so that when I got hit with the glass bottles it didn't hurt as much, yeah, hurting less does not mean not hurting. <laughs> I hear you. I quit a show <laughs> once because of that not sugar glass specifically but but yeah it was it was supposed to be all stage combat but stage combat is painful i can i can handle state i can handle stage combat what i was mad at is the fact that you're supposed to gimmick the wooden bar stool so that they break easy mm-hmm. somebody forgot to do that oh yikes so i get so and keep in mind it's not one take <laughs> we we were do, we were doing takes for like 3 days Oh, and no. <laughs> I mean, I I knew what I had signed up for, but I was mad mm-hmm. that I was mad that the t- that they didn't gimmick the t- that they didn't gimmick the bar stool, so I got hit with it hard way. Oh no! I think oh, the only no. reason I got away I think the only reason I was able to get away with it was because I was big was because I was the tallest the tallest guy in the whole set. Mm-hmm. I, I'm I was I was six I was six one at the time. I'm six six. Wow. <laughs> so what, you were in third grade or <laughs> No. No, I had I had just I had just gotten out of high school at the time. Um uh, and I was I looked older than I looked older than I was. <laughs> mm-hmm. Even even before then I'd when I would go when I would go to buffets I would I would um I would have to I would have to go into this long argument when it came to getting the kids discount because people didn't think <laughs> I was a kid. <laughs> yeah, I could see that happening. Yeah, people automatically associate height with age. Which I don't which I don't get I've never gotten and it's it's one of those mysteries that is left for the great minds of the universe cuz clearly my mind is not great enough for that. <laughs> um but when I was do when I was doing the re- when I was doing that research on the mega musical, there was one name that came up with the best and worst parts of it, who I consider okay. the living avatar of it, and that's um, Weber, Andrew oh. Lloyd Weber. Yes, yes. And I began to notice a pattern with him. He's when he's good, he's good, but he does. But I'm not sure if he knows how to take criticism. <laughs> Yes, um, I have a podcast recommendation for you if you would like to learn more about Andrew Lloyd Webber and if you would like to go into the inner workings of one particular musical, um, I suggest the podcast called The Sunset Project. And the, the host, creator, his name is Broadway Bob. And I became friends with him on Instagram because I loved his podcast so much. So he um, he goes deep into Sunset Boulevard, especially mm-hmm. there was a controversy about Patti LuPone versus Glenn Close. Uh, both of them played the lead role of Nor- Norma Desmond in different productions. And so there was quite a bit of angst involved with that. And then um, I found out that 
I, was it through? It might have been through listening to the podcast. This is so weird. But I found out that a friend of mine who's here based in L.A., um, and I've known her for years here in L.A., she worked on the project. She was a, a, a lyricist. She, she was hired by Andrew Lloyd Webber, and she worked with him for over a year and a half mm-hmm. on that show. And she has a lot of interesting tales to tell. So maybe maybe you'd enjoy having her on your podcast sometime. Oh. She also she was so she was on um uh the Sunset Project, but oh my gosh, she has such an interesting career cuz she's gone on to write songs for Mattel, for the mm-hmm. Barbie franchise and all kinds of other things. Mhm. Um and truth, truth be told, the thing that put the thing that put me down this musical rabbit hole was me trying to figure out what the hell happened to the Spider-Man musical. Oh yeah. Because I, rem- I remember it getting announced, then it, then um I didn't hear anything about it, and then I heard it got canceled. Then I heard it got it was closing up, and I was cu- I I thought okay maybe it just didn't do as well as they had hoped. Then I did a bit digging, and I fa- and I found out the sto- the um, rabbit hole was a little bit deeper than I had um, initially thought. Mm-hmm. Um, and apparently, so- apparently, somebody didn't learn their lesson from the Carrie musical of trying to introduce Greek things into where into mm-hmm. places it doesn't belong. Mm-hmm. Because, well, short version on that. Imagine having imagine having somebody from the UK suddenly have to get come to grasp with American high school culture and being told think Greece. Yeah, now, that's confusing. Now, <laughs> if I say if I say the fra- if I say the phrase think Greece in the context of a musical, where do you where does your mind go? Well, three act structure, that's for sure. Uh the Greeks invented that, I think. Oh, uh, no, I said th- <laughs> Well, he, here's the th- here's the thing. He had told him think Greece, as in, as in the John Travolta vehicle. Oh, that Greece! <laughs> and, but the but here but the funniest part, what you were thinking of is what they ended up doing. So you have kids on roller skates and togas, and they did, and the staff didn't realize it until the set was already made, and they're like, oh god, we have to we have to work with this. Yes, when when instructing someone to follow Greece as an example, you must be very very specific, or else unintended humor will ensue. That's for sure. First yeah. of all, you must spell it and spell it correctly. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh. Yes, big difference between ancient Greece and twentieth century Greece. Mm-hmm. Oh. <laughs> It's like some it's like somebody being told to bring German shepherds on set and they get and they get some people from Germany. Yes, who who herd sheep, like p- people with staffs and sheep Yeah, ne- dogs next and thing you know you got five guys in lederhosen. Yeah, yeah. And that but, could be adorable in some situations, but it doesn't it doesn't work every time. No. 50% of the time it doesn't work every time. <laughs> yeah, I had I had to get that joke out of my system, but <laughs> um, now a lot, a lot of the with a lot of the works that you that I found when I was doing my research, you were you were credited as a as a producer or some or something within that umbrella. Mm-hmm. So, one thing I'm curious about was the transition between between um mu- between doing musical the- between doing musical theater and producing. What were what were some of the things you kind of had to learn on the fly about? Well, I started behind the scenes, so to speak, through temping, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had a, a brief period of time where I worked as an agent assistant, and then um, and then I was a, a, a production coordinator, and then um, I had a period of unemployment, so I registered with a temp agency. And then through that temp agency, I was placed at a company called Renaissance Atlantic Films in mm-hmm. Los Angeles, which was a, a two-person office when I joined. And um, so I came on board 
as a temporary assistant. And it turned out they had a permanent position available. And after two weeks, I was offered the assistant position. And um, I always wanted to act like that's really all I ever wanted to do was perform. But um, I, I thought getting my MFA in musical theater would allow me to have a comfortable life, perhaps teaching and then having flexibility to go to auditions and so forth. And, and that did not work out. I could not break into academia. I still haven't. I still have not broken into academia. It is super hard. Mm -hmm. And um, especially when you're in Los Angeles and you're competing with people from all over the planet who also have MFAs but have Oscars and Emmys and Tonys and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so that plan didn't work out. And I did not want to be the kind of actor who waited tables because I'm, I can, I can tap dance, but I cannot carry plates. I'm not very coordinated in that regard. So uh, I knew I would need to find something else like a desk job. And, and I was interested in, in writing theoretically, I thought, you know, and when I was in grad school, we did have to write material for ourselves. So, um, so anyway, I pursued that temp temping route, which quite frankly, no one cares what your uh, ambitions are when you're a temp, you're the lowest person on, on the, the rung of the, the lowest rung of the ladder. Mm -hmm. And, um, you're just a body who's uh, doing the work that nobody else wants to do. So I, I started at this company and then was hired after a couple of weeks. And then I stayed there for five years. And the other, the, there was the owner of the company, then he had a director of development. And then there was me as the assistant. And then after a year or so, the director of development left and I became uh, the only person in the office besides the owner of the company. So I wore a lot of hats and some of that was producing and, and producing is essentially project management. It, mm -hmm. it, and, and there's so many things that can be squeezed into that box. It's not like producing is, um, all the time glamorous and lofty, uh, a lot of times it, it involves hand holding and um, picking up trash physically. It, yes, my, and this is Blanche, oh, my, that park my, was well timed. <laughs> <laughs> She's she has excellent timing. This is my um, my partner in Pink Poodle Productions, Blanche <laughs> Dubois Sharp, and uh, you might hear her chime in because she just woke up from her nap. So she's usually very opinionated after. She, after she wakes up, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so so I just I was the only other person in the office. So for this guy who owned the company, uh, he had no problem asking me to go pick up his dry cleaning and babysit his kids and buy Christmas presents and so forth, and asking me to find distribution for a library of films that he owned and putting together shoots for various things and attending film markets and other stuff that producers do. So it was a weird job for sure, but I, I learned a lot. And then I stuck in that, I got stuck in that area of kids and family entertainment and animation and also overseas intellectual property. So mm -hmm. the company Renaissance Atlantic was the consultant consultancy of Frank Ward, who was instrumental in bringing Power Rangers outside of Japan and to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. So he had been the president of Bandai America and he, along with another gentleman named Haim Saban, formed a, uh, a partnership, so to speak, and they they shopped Power Rangers for about seven years <laughs> outside, <laughs> outside of Japan and were turned down everywhere, all over the planet. And then it was only after the Fox Kids Network 
decided to give them some time uh, on on the on that Fox Kids channel, and uh, they didn't pay a license fee, so there was no money being earned from the program airing, but. They didn't have to pay, <laughs> the meaning Bandai and Saban didn't have to pay to put the show on, like, like it wasn't commercial time. Um, but uh, yeah, they really wanted the show on the air because they thought if kids could see the play pattern, then for sure they'd want the toys, even though the production value, especially of those early episodes, is questionable. <laughs> And, That's uh, putting it lightly. Right. They were right. It didn't matter. It did not matter. And I remember the uh, when I first started working at Renaissance Atlantic, and uh, I, w I wasn't hugely familiar with Power Rangers. I mean, I I knew what it was, but I I can't say that I was a fan or a viewer. But then when I found out that was the company's uh, calling card, and and all those other. Japanese shows that had toys associated with them. I was kind of embarrassed. I was like, huh, I can't brag to people that I work on this. This is terrible. Like this these are the worst TV shows ever. <laughs> like the there's no continuity and it's it's a big old mess and it's like so it 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 looks like high school theater or maybe grammar school like the acting is so broad and I can't tell anybody that I'm working on this um but then then I really I had like a tough love experience where I learned about the business of show business especially the cutthroat business of kids content and kids content is designed to sell stuff to kids no matter what anybody tells you, I'm here to dispel the myth. It is all about selling stuff to kids. And it, and not not for nefarious reasons. No. Well, not always. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> only sometimes. Mm -hmm. But uh but it, it's it, there's a reason for that. The history of kids cartoons especially um there was a time when the networks when there were only three networks around, they would commission the toy companies to make shows based on their toys. Like uh, maybe CBS would commission Mattel to make uh, episodes, you know, a show about He-Man or something like that. And uh, and and so um, Mattel would you know as assemble what was needed to to do that and and they would integrate the toys and the the animation and and what have you and then they'd sell to the network the network would pay top dollar and then Mattel would keep 100% of the royalties of all the toy sales and so at some point after years of doing this the networks were like hey wait a minute uh, we're paying you to make these shows, but then you're making the big bucks. So we either want to share in the toy revenue or, mm -hmm. um, or else. <laughs> and then they started cutting back on the amount of money that, that they gave to the toy companies to commission these shows. And so, so it still is a thing today where kids content, the, the revenue that is generated from licensing the actual shows is minimal. In fact, um, here's an example for you. When I worked at Sega and mm -hmm. we did Sonic Boom for Cartoon Network, um, the, the amount of money that we earned from Cartoon Network US was like in the thousands of dollars, in the uh, like four figure range per episode. It was nothing. Mm -hmm. And we also had an ad commitment. So we had to buy a certain amount of commercials in addition to having the show Sonic Boom running. So if Sega didn't make money on toys and video games and all that stuff, it was a big money loser. Um, and uh, so, yeah, and that's quite common. Like when, when Lego has a show on a kids network or a streamer 
there's a very complicated deal now that happens, but there's no, it's no more of a, a platform or a channel or a broadcaster paying the toy company or the IP owner a big fee and then not sharing in the, the revenue for the, the ancillaries. So I know it's kind of, it's kind of uh, complicated, but um, th this is your your uh, behind the scenes of the cutthroat world <laughs> of oh. kids and family <laughs> and cartoons. Yeah, I've I learned a long time ago that that um that say, saying something is complicated is <laughs> a bit redundant. No offense, because because everything is is some degree of comp. Of some degree of complication. I agree. And that that and th that and there's been plenty of there's been plenty of stories of just the absolute hell to get to get anything done. You know, anything you see on the screen, it is a miracle that it got there. It is just anything, any a commercial, PSA, anything. Well, I do have I do have a experience that kind of relates to that because, um, a long t when I was when I was st when I was still doing stage work, I was involved in a chamber play, and a, ch a chamber play involving myself and one other person. We had been rehearsing for weeks and weeks on end, and I do consider chamber plays to be significantly more difficult than other forms of plays because of how few people you have to work with. Mm -hmm. And the day of, this isn't this wasn't a this wasn't a rehearsal or a dress rehearsal. This was the day of the show. My partner comes up and he goes, "Yeah, I f yeah, I forgot my lines." All of them. All of them. Uh -oh. And. I he is he should consider himself so fortunate that I not only took the time to remember my lines but remember everybody else's lines just in case something happened. Oh my goodness. What so, a nightmare. I had so I had to go th and we didn't have and we didn't have he ended up telling me this mere minutes before we were going to start. So I had to go through the whole thing um doing my part while feeding him his part. And not making sh and making it sure that nobody could tell I was doing it. That sounds like a one-man show. <laughs> it more or less was, and he ended up getting the dressing down of a lifetime after we were finished. Oh, that's good. As, lo as long as he was severely punished, then oh, it wasn't. He wasn't punished by the he wasn't punished by the bosses because I was I was I was yelling and going full tirade on him for about five minutes. Okay, well, that's <laughs> and, something. <laughs> and. In the out of the corner of my eye, I, I, I see I see that I see that one of my colleagues was um was motioning to the others, hey Mil hey Mil hey Mildred's get hey Mildred's yelling at somebody because I was the last guy in the room to ever get mad about anything. You know you so that know made an impression. Thing. Yeah, <laughs> you know the whole thing of of don't of don't piss off the quiet guy. Yes. That I think I think that's what made um made it such a spectacle because when I was done I realized there were about five people watching me as 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 if we as if we were the actual show that's great they got bonus entertainment value at so someone at someone else's you. expense <laughs> it's at someone else's expense but I remember what um what Mel Brooks once said about dark comedy what's that tragedy is when I cut my finger Comedy is when you fall into an open sewer hole and die. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but now speaking of that, since we brought, since Sonic Boom was brought up, how did you how did you first how did you first get in with Sega and what was it like work what was it like working with Sega? So this is so crazy, but I got my job at Sega through LinkedIn, which is why I am LinkedIn's biggest cheerleader and brand ambassador uh, because the recruiter just found me on LinkedIn. Now, truth be told, I am a maniac on LinkedIn. I'm always posting and linking with people and so forth. So it's pretty easy to find me on LinkedIn. <clears throat> but still, uh, I didn't have to apply through a diabolical 
portal of a black hole of applications. It was just a recruiter who found me. And um, so at the time, in 2015, Sega was moving its US operations from the Bay Area to Burbank. And so they had been up in San Francisco for 30 something years and they were closing that all down. They were laying off just about everybody and they were moving a handful of people to Burbank and then otherwise staffing up from scratch. But they wanted a skeleton crew so they wanted a small group of people to do everything that a big group of people had done for a long time in San Francisco. So um, anyway, the recruiter was specifically looking for people who had experience working with Japanese toy and game companies because there's a, a way that things are done, especially with... Um, what's called the production committees in Japan mm -hmm. and so for for anime especially there there are these joint ventures that happen and it, it's different it's different than working with co-productions that are just like American Canadian or mm -hmm. just a, American companies collaborating or what have you so anyway I had all that Bandai Saban Fox Kids stuff on my resume and then after after that I had worked with a lot of Korean companies so I had an, an all like animation that was merchandise driven so that's mm -hmm. what they were looking for so I, 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 I'm sure my CV went through the search engine and popped up for this recruiter she found me and like 15 interviews later I got the job <laughs> and um, and so I was hired along with uh, a, another woman, Masami Tokunaga, who is also based here in Burbank. And so she, so I reported to Masami, and basically the two of us were hired to oversee the second season of Sonic Boom on behalf of Sega because the show had six executive producers who were third parties. They were, and Sega, di Sega was paying for a large part of the production and there were no Sega employees who were calling the major creative shots on the show. So um, anyway, they tried to restructure a bit for season two and uh, so Masami and I came on board and then we, um, we hired two coordinators, um, Jasmine and Ayumi, who were awesome. And Jasmine and Ayumi are still at Sega and Masami and I are not. Well, actually, Masami works for TMS, which is a Sega company. So I guess you could say the three of them are Sega employees. I'm, I am not anymore. But um, yeah, so we, we came on board to oversee the second season of Sonic Boom, but there was so much going on with so few people that we were pulled into a lot of different projects especially in 2016 because that was Sonic's 25th birthday mm -hmm. year and we started our jobs in June of 2015 and there were there were no activities planned for his birthday and that's like a huge historical moment and a lot of missed opportunity if nothing is done to celebrate it so we had to scramble to plan stuff all during the year on social media, in real life, um, and with uh, partners all over the all over the world, because we had the sh we had Sonic Boom airing in a hundred plus countries, and you know there were opportunities to do promotional things, and then there were the games and to integrate all that. So anyway. We, we worked very hard and um, so I was I was lucky in the sense that I I got to do a lot of different things there and I, I did contribute to the first Sonic the Hedgehog movie hmm. um, you won't see my name in the credits though so that's kind of annoying but, um, <laughs> but a lot of people worked on that movie who a lot of people who aren't credited worked on that movie so I'm in good company with a lot of very talented folks. 
And um, and that movie was in development for a lot of years before it actually saw the light of day. So, um, so yeah, and uh, it didn't feel like I was working on anything iconic at the time. It seemed like a lot of pain and suffering because Sonic, we were trying to revive the brand. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like doors opened and angels sang for us. It was everything we did. It was, and we had such a small budget and we were always very scrappy in what we did. Um, but hey, I guess it paid off. I guess we, we laid a good foundation and then Sonic came back and in a big way. So, and since you, since you brought up the Sonic movie, I do have to, that means I'm I'd say I'm contractually obligated, but not but not exactly. I just like using that for a gag. But I ha I have to bring up how how there was that initial there was that initial trailer that launched that caused that that caused that massive blowback, and then there was the announcement of doing the delay. Were you on Were you on the ground for that, or did you come in after that had went down? I was there before that happened. So, so I left Sega at the end of 2017 and I was working for another Japanese game company that had offices in LA. So I was working at level five mm -hmm. on Yokai watch and bunches of other stuff for, for level five. Um, but I had hired one of my old Sega coworkers to work at level five on social media with me and um, so he and I were always watching very closely to see what I mean we had friends who worked at Sega and and you know level five is a lot like Sega in many many ways and so um, anyway we watched very closely and we witnessed that whole moment uh, in time with everybody else in the world but um, but we weren't working there at the time but um, I I know a bit of the backstory from people who were there in the trenches, and uh, so, if you have any questions, um, fire away. <laughs> I guess when, I guess the I guess the main the main thing that I that I want to get that I want to get is what is what people's reaction was when they saw, when the initial react when the what people's um, reaction fr from on the ground was when when the blowback for the trailer happened and what and what it was when the when the delay was announced cuz obviously just on the outside looking in even though even though I was laughing the whole way um I wasn't privy to all of that obviously yeah so um so what i've heard on good authority is that sega and probably to a certain extent paramount mm -hmm. was horrified because they did not intend to create something grotesque that would enrage the fans. What the intention was, and again, this is what I hear from my colleagues who were there, so I was not there, but I trust, mm -hmm. I trust that I'm hearing the true story. So there was not agreement internally on the design of Sonic for the movie. There were the auteurs represented by Neil Moritz, the Fast and the Furious impresario, who's executive producer, and Tim Miller, the Deadpool guy, who, were executive, who was also an executive producer, and Jeff Fowler, the director, who is a longtime employee of Tim Miller. They had they, they and their side had, and, and they are key stakeholders for sure. They had a certain way that they wanted Sonic to be portrayed in the movie. And Sega and so Sonic Team, who oversees all the canon and design stuff, they had a different way. And the Sega way was more of the traditional way that fans think of Sonic, it's emphasizing the adorableness and the sassy and just kind of like classic Sonic, mm -hmm. uh, but only in CG form. And um, the auteurs, wanted a hardcore, almost like a horror movie Sonic. Like they wanted a scary, threatening predator. 
<laughs> That's all I can say because I've seen some of the designs for those for that Sonic. And so um, there was a very small group of people, one person in particular who worked for Marza Animation Planet, which is a Sega-owned CG studio that was involved in the movie, didn't didn't do a ton of the stuff that you saw on the screen, but Marza was very instrumental in in managing the development through the years and and being the liaison between Sega Japan and um, the outside stakeholders who invested in the project, the the tours that we're talking about. So um, this one particular guy was caught in the middle, and he he actually, God bless him, he takes full responsibility for the snafu that happened. Mm -hmm. He said that the design of Ugly Sonic was a result of his effort to have both sides get along because there was all this infighting about, no, Sonic should look this way. No, he should look this way. No, he should be cute. No, he needs to be more badass. And so they went back and forth and back and forth, and um, that's what they ended up with. Unfortunately, Ugly Sonic was a compromise. That that's, uh, He was compromised, but he was <laughs> and he was the result of trying to get the two so divergent sides to get along and so so my <clears throat> my friend who who felt like oh I res resolved the conflict I'm sure at some point he was just like I don't even care what the Sonic looks like anymore as long as I don't have two sides trying to pull me apart I, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's good enough so they went ahead with the trailer and then what happened happened and Sega I think was probably more horrified than anybody because that's that's their brand. That's mm -hmm. the. That's not just their. Um, that that's the company mascot. That's their flagship brand, uh, or, or it's not their flagship brand, but it's it's a core brand, and um, you know that's a big chunk of their business. And then, well, but one thing that was a silver lining that happened. Well, there were a couple of silver linings. One is, is that Paramount, the 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 studio. Um, partially financing and distributing the movie um, they had their analytics teams do all this social listening about the comments and this and the that and so they they had some kind of a um, how did he how did he put it he said that they discovered that there was like a 96 percent unfavorable reaction on 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 the internet that was their conclusion of all the social listening and focus groups and whatnot that they did but but paramount said in their wisdom and looking at other case studies that if they could turn that around like the numbers were so huge that if they could turn that around they'd have a massive hit on their hands so that's the way they decided to focus on the positive and so uh, they took an artist who I had worked very closely with, his name is Tyson Hess, and we had hired him to do some Sonic Mania shorts because after Sonic Boom, we took a break from investing in TV series content and we decided we, meaning Sega, mm -hmm. big Sega that, owned, that holds the purse strings, they wanted us to have like a very small budget and see what we could do with YouTube because we had just lost a whole bunch of money with Sonic Boom. And um, so we hired Tyson, who is a, a marvelous artist and also a fan favorite. He has um, been an illustrator for the comic books for years. He signed autographs at Sonic's 25th birthday party. He's got quite a large social media following. And he, he he designed the Sonic uh, Sonic Mania Adventures is the name of the short mm -hmm. uh, the short series, and so um, the decision was made to send Tyson to the UK, where the the key team of animators and designers who are working on this, this, this specifically on Sonic, they sent him there to teach them how to draw Sonic <laughs> and how to realize Sonic as in a way that fans would accept and it worked 
and um, and and so the the whole reason why we even had Tyson on the Sonic Mania Adventures is due to our social media guy, Aaron Weber. So Aaron had been really good friends with Tyson, and Aaron had gotten him involved in the 25th birthday stuff, and and then he suggested him as like our our main designer for the Sonic Mania Adventures. And so um, Aaron and Aaron is a fanboy himself. Like mm -hmm. he's he's the embodiment of Sonic the Hedgehog, actually. And so um, so it was through Aaron's involvement in the film that got Tyson in there. And um, and the best thing about the sequel is that both Aaron and Tyson finally got producer credits on the movie. So in the first movie, Tyson's credit was, I think, storyboard supervisor or something like that. And he his credit was like embedded in the, in the scroll at the end of the movie. Not a lot of people saw, <clears throat> saw it. I don't think Aaron got a credit at all. And then watching movie two, I, I stayed till the bitter end because I love to see my friends' names in the credits. Mm -hmm. And Tyson is now a co-producer on the whole franchise. And his name is big as daylight in the in the first set of credits. Like he's he's very prominent on the screen as a co-producer. And then Aaron got an associate producer credit. Mm -hmm. So um, to me, those were the two best moments of the sequel were to see Aaron and Tyson finally getting their yeah. props. Now, since you mentioned Level 5, which is a game company that I, ha that I have a storied history with over, over the last few generations, I haven't worked with them directly, just just co just covering their work in my own manner. Mm -hmm. um, what can you tell me about your experience work working with them? Well, unfortunately, they changed. They just there was a decision made, and I guess I don't know for sure because I never did hear directly from Hinosan. Hinosan is the founder of the company, and and the creator of everything that comes out of there, and. I suppose he and maybe Densu, that was a minority investor in the, the uh, Level 5 Abbey, which was the international branch of Level 5, and that was the branch that I worked for, the decision was made to shut it all down. So at the end of 2019, um, Level 5 Abbey had offices in the US, in Hong Kong, and Seoul. And all of those offices were shut down, so that was the end of my job there. And um, I think since that time, I, I don't follow their news very closely, but just just a little bit. But from what I've read, they've really pulled back all of their business that is not Japan centric. I, I don't even know if they bother to localize their games anymore. I um. And it's it's not hugely surprising because Hino-san was very clear, or it seemed clear to me, that he really enjoyed creating games for the Japanese market. He's like a savant when it comes to tapping into the zeitgeist there and creating massive hits for the Japanese market. But he was brought into localization for other territories kicking and screaming, more or less. Uh, I think just he had these massive successes, especially Yokai Watch, that like suddenly people were coming out of the woodwork all over the world throwing money at him, and he went for it for a while, but then at a certain point, he was like, I don't need to do this anymore. And uh, and again, this is me theorizing. I, I don't have this in writing. And Hino-san does not speak English, so I've met him, but never talk to him so um, just kind of waved and and I would hear like secondhand through translators yeah. and whatnot what he had to say but I think it's really sad because there is a massive fan base outside of Japan and I see people people just lamenting the fact that there's there's where's the new Inazuma 11 game and you know where where's Yokai watch? Shadow side and you know other other things that 
came out in Japan that people knew about in other parts of the world, and then they're not available to the global fan base. So I think that's really sad, but it's Hino-san's company, and he really doesn't owe it to anybody to continue. I mean, maybe maybe it's just too stressful for him, and uh, who knows? But it's very it, it was very sad. I, I really loved the Level 5 properties, and I mm -hmm. enjoyed working on them. Um, when you meant... When you mentioned the whole kicking and screaming thing, it did bring something up that I don't know if it was a contributing factor into into his recent into that decision you're you're discussing, but I can't help but wonder if it was a, if it was at the back of my mind. And admittedly, this is me pulling a bit of a crackpot theory, but in the in the mid two thousands, Level Five was working on was working on a um. M, uh, on a online game called True Fantasy Live Online. Mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm not sure if I'm not sure if this was ever brought up dur during your time, but to get to give a bit of the skinny, it was supposed to be it was supposed to be the killer app for the Japanese release of Xbox Live. Mm -hmm. And one of the the key things was was that it was trying to be a MMO like experience, just. Just rel but relying primarily on voice chat instead of using um, text prompts like a lot of like a lot of MMOs have done at the time and still do. Mm -hmm. um, it never came out, and there was a rumor going about that there were some disagreements between what Level Five wanted to do with the project and what Microsoft wanted to do. The story that I had heard for the longest time was that one side, one side wanted a more ca one side wanted a more casual affair, something akin to World of Warcraft. And I know that I know that sounds contradictory to consider World of Warcraft casual, but I mean in a dip in and dip out kind of sense. And mm -hmm. com compared to World of Warcraft's um, contemporaries at that time, it could be considered more casual. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think. I think that's what level five had wanted, whereas Microsoft wanted something that required a longer dedication, and the example given was EverQuest. Mm -hmm. And I think shortly afterwards, somebody from level f from level five, maybe a spokesperson or anything like that, um, gave off the imp the impl. I don't remember what was said, but the implication was the two sides did not part on the best of terms. Now, granted, this was the early two thousands. But I can't help but wonder if if that sort of disagreement might have might have played a tiny factor into things. Again, this is my crackpot theory on this. But when the but when there's that when there's that big when there's that big of a cancellation over something that was supposed to be a flagship, mm -hmm. um, that's something I don't. That's something that I think sticks in in someone's mind. Yeah, I. I cannot confirm or deny that because I don't I don't know that that was way before my time there but I guess it's possible people get in business disputes all the time and um, and yeah people get in family disputes all the time <laughs> all kinds of disputes so it yeah it could it could have happened that way but the, the team that I was working with in the LA office, nobody had worked for level five that far back. I think the person who had the longest tenure was Yukari Hayakawa, who was the chief operating officer of level five Abbey. And she had been there for like four years and she had worked, I think mainly in the LA office. I don't think she ever worked in Japan. So, so she wasn't on the ground witnessing what happened during the mid 2000s or anything yeah. like that um now one of the one of the things that i can that i came across recently that you that you've been involved with is the is um is this is working alongside rain shine entertainment and in particular um young captain nemo yes um what can you tell me about how how that how that got off the ground so that is a movie trilogy that's based on a book trilogy by the author Jason Henderson. 
And the book trilogy is intended for middle grade readers. It's, it's like an early chapter book, but it has some sophisticated character development, some, uh, some compelling lore in it, and it, it's a best-selling book series. And so, so I know Jason Henderson, the author. He and I actually met at Digital Hollywood Summit where both of us had been panelists and guest speakers for a number of years. And so he, he's quite a prolific author. And at one of the, it might have been Digital Hollywood Summit 2019, he showed me, uh, I guess they were early copies of, of the, the first Nemo book. And then at the end of 2019, I started working for Rain Shine Entertainment as the head of IP strategy and acquisitions. And one of my major job tasks was to look for intellectual properties that had some kind of wow factor behind them and bring those things into the company so that we could adapt them for the screen and consumer products and so forth. So. So that's what I did. I, I circulated it through the company and um, we, we had looked at a lot of different projects and that one resonated with Rain Chime's home office in India. The protagonist, um, Gabriel Nemo, who's a descendant of old Captain Nemo from the Jules Verne's books, the source material, um, he is of Indian descent. and. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but old Captain Nemo is of Indian descent as well. That's kind of been uh, whitewashed a bit in the movies and um, spin-off type of material that has come from the Jules Verne 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. But the it, it's very authentic for a company that's headquartered in India to take a uh, an intellectual property like this and then try to realize it for the screen and for for lots of different territories because um, there there is that sensibility in the company where we have Amer offices in the US offices in London and the headquarters is in India mm -hmm. and um, of course that's all that that's behind the scenes knowledge we're just trying to tell a good story with the the book so we're turning them into three animated movies they probably won't run in theaters they'll probably be movies for streaming and we're in production now and you mentioned you mentioned um, having offices in mul in multiple countries i've mm -hmm. i've seen i've seen stories of video game development where they where they were where um, studio where you had studios in several yeah, in several countries some of the, the main studio and a bunch of helper studios and in, and sometimes um, trying to trying to trying to juggle all of that can be an adventure to say the least mm -hmm. um, how what did, what can you tell me about the experience of, of trying to de deal with multiple offices and multiple time zones like that <laughs> It's very challenging. Uh, oftentimes, you have two, at least two work days. Because I've worked with Japanese companies, Korean companies. I worked for a Jordanian company for a while, and then now Rainshine, which the headquarters is in India. So often you'll have like your re regular work day here in Los Angeles, Pacific Standard Time, and then come five o'clock, where it's like nine o'clock or uh, thereabouts in another country <laughs> in the in the Far East or the Middle East or wherever um, then that's when the second work day starts because then you c connect with your colleagues who are at the the other offices and so it it's challenging to schedule video conferences and calls and deadlines get messy because it's like oh no I thought it was my you know it's due on August 1st my time no it's August 1st you know uh, UK time or what have you <laughs> so so yeah but it, it it is really interesting and rewarding to get to travel to those places and to 
learn about other cultures and uh, you end up, at least in my experience, when you work for a company that's headquartered in another country, it's almost as if you are adopted by that country to a certain extent because you, you get to be very familiar with their holidays for sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then you, you learn all, all about the culture from video chats and various other forms of communication and then and then it's always such a uh, an eye-opening experience to go and visit ground zero in whatever <laughs> whatever country that is you visit the home office and usually there's there are some things that are the way you expected but other things are vastly different so so that's uh, I, I like that I like learning and discovering other cultures through work. I think it, it, um, I think it's good for the human spirit, for, for anybody, no matter what business you're in. Um, I think it, it gives you a chance to almost walk in somebody else's shoes mm -hmm. as close as you can get anyway. And uh, I like it. And well, for, for me, the only, the, only downs, the only downside that I'd have going to other countries and, and seeing those offices is um, tall guy problems. <laughs> oh, well, oh, yeah. But I would think you'd be like a superstar. You'd be like, uh, you know, uh, yeah, you you would really. I, my my ex-boyfriend had that experience traveling in, I think, China and Japan because he's tall and also has blonde hair and blue eyes. And so he said, especially in China, a lot of crowds would gather and follow him because I guess they, and he, he was in a lot of small towns too. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but he loved it. He'd never gotten so much attention in his life. Like he, he was ready to move there. He thought it was awesome. Yeah. Um, um, I can, I can certainly see that it's just, it's just, I always, I always dread anytime I have to get on a plane because of. <laughs> Of being, of being too damn tall. Yes, because even for small people, the airplane is uncomfortable. And even if I even if I bump myself up to business class or something like that, that doesn't help. Oh yeah, it yeah. Oh man, yeah. I never thought of that, but you're right. That that would be a, a factor to take into consideration before taking any kind of extended flight. Mm-hmm. And one thing now with that with that in mind, um, I know I know you mentioned young Cap young Captain Nemo is is in is in production, but beyond that, where where else can pe can people find you or fi or find what you happen to be getting yourself into? That's a good question. Uh, well, I'm on LinkedIn quite often, so I, please. Anyone in your audience, link with me, and you can read my voluminous posts <laughs> and uh, enjoy them. And then I'm on all the usual social channels: Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and I. My website is pinkpoodleproductions.com. And what else? Uh, yeah, and I, I occasionally I'll write articles for independent publications, humor articles, and um, uh, just just my musings on various things. And sometimes I I will co-write with Blanche, my mm -hmm. canine companion here. And um, so yeah, if you Google me, you'll you'll find me in all sorts of places. And I love to be on people's podcasts. So mm -hmm. that's. Uh, that's those are my frequent stops. They're in the in the ether as I go and appear on these various shows. Mm -hmm. Well, with all that in mind, I would like to sincerely thank you for braving the hell of time zones and coming all the way up to <laughs> my temple to enjoy the madness that happens around here. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. This is a pleasure. Mm -hmm. This is a and lovely temple. Anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Awesome. <laughs> oh, 
And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>